On September 14, 2015, these long arms of the LIGO Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory in Livingston, Louisiana, and its twin detector, 1,900 miles away in Hanford, Washington, appeared to make the first detection of a wave of what is known as warped space, created by a massive collision of two black holes, unlike anything astronomers had ever seen in the visible universe. It would be just as a hundred years of Einstein's general theory of relativity predicted, and the first time we on Earth experienced and measured a remnant of the violent warping of space and time that is a gravitational wave. If true, LIGO's discovery would open up the 95% of the universe that's dark to our existing observatories and space-based telescopes. Until now, we have only seen warped space-time. We as scientists have only seen warped space-time, but it is very calm. As though we had only seen the surface of the ocean on a very calm day when it's quite glassy. We had never seen the ocean roiled in a storm with crashing waves. The colliding black holes that produce these gravitational waves create a, a violent storm in the fabric of space and time. We began filming a documentary about LIGO one month earlier in August 2015. And we were there at the LIGO Livingston Observatory outside of Baton Rouge. We arrive on Sunday, September 13th, three days before the planned launch of Advanced LIGO the five-year, $200 million upgrade to the two exquisitely complex detectors, which even before the upgrade were the most sensitive instruments for measurement the world had ever known. What do they hope to measure? Ray Weiss is the creator of the LIGO detectors. He describes the footprint, so to speak, of a gravitational wave. Everybody who has contemplated it, especially if they're engineers and have their feet on the ground, that's when they throw you out of the room. And they say, that's not possible. Now let's, how do I, let's put it into some sort of context that you understand better. It's not easy to make a context where it's understandable, but let's take uh, the distance between us and the sun and so want to measure that to a precision of putting one extra atom, one extra atom in the path between the light that goes from the earth to the sun. That is a tiny, tiny amount. Or another way of thinking about it is, it's like measuring the distance from the Earth to the nearest star to a precision of the width of a human hair. It's ridiculous, right? How will LIGO know and measure the waves? The space between its mirrors is warped, stretched and distorted by the wave as it passes through. The magic to do that is that if you measure the size of something, you're measuring some absolute size. Interferometry measures the difference in two distances. So we have a pair of mirrors that are four kilometers apart. The gravitational wave has changed the way you measure space between those two objects. It has distorted the space. We send laser light into the interferometer, and that light bounces back and forth in the arms. But if they change their length for any reason, including the passage of a gravitational wave, then that leaks a little light through onto these in-vacuum photodiodes. And that's where we can read out the signal. So the interferometer is designed to be sensitive to the differential changes of the arm lengths. Gravitational waves are really hard to understand because there's no, what's the medium? You know, what's the thing that, it's not like water waves or sound waves which propagate through air. It's literally space itself that's fluctuating. And it turns out that space is really stiff. So you need a really big force to be able to get that space to jiggle back and forth to ripple. The crew and I knew all of this, and the fact that because the mirrors are set 2.5 miles, or four kilometers apart, in two long vacuum tube arms, LIGO had to take into account the curvature of the Earth when placing the mirrors and pointing the laser beams. We knew this but we weren't prepared for what we found when we arrived that Sunday. LIGO Livingston had been knocked offline by an earthquake in Mexico, 2,000 miles away. We understood immediately that we had walked into a different realm of the physical world. But looking back, it was an almost perfect introduction. 
It was topped off a year and a half later when we were in the control room of the Hanford detector, the moment it was knocked offline by an earthquake in Africa on the other side of the world. We didn't feel the earthquake. It wasn't the shaking. It was the low frequency aftershocks that traveled around the world and knocked the fragile complexity of this instrument out of lock. Distant, extremely large magnitude quakes, magnitude eight and above, they can have us offline for several hours while the earth rings down and those waves travel around and around, loop around the earth. LIGO hopes to measure a wave of one billion year old warp space in the most precise measurement ever made in history, if successful. Yet an earthquake you couldn't feel from thousands of miles away could knock them offline. Let's not even talk about the logging trucks that rumbled past Livingston every day or wind across the high desert of eastern Washington that pushed and tilted the buildings enough to throw the laser beams off track. Or even what they called ice craving ravens. But the loss of lock at Livingston that Sunday is good for us. We we're able to go down one of the vacuum tube arms to interview Gabriela Gonzalez, the Argentinian physicist who is the spokesperson for the LIGO scientific collaboration elected by the 1,000 physicists and engineers around the world who make up the collaboration. Some of them, like Ray Weiss and Kip Thorne, have been working on it for half a century. It has been Gabby Gonzalez's life's work for 25 years. We are very excited about starting this run because it's the first time we'll do it with advanced LIGO detectors. We'll see farther than ever before, three times farther than we did with initial LIGO. But we are making it short. We're only taking data for three months compared to years that we did before because we don't think that we will have enough sensitivity to see events even if we wait for a year or so until we get better. So we don't have high expectations of having a discovery, but we could. <laughs> we could be lucky. I mean, these events happen rarely, so we could be lucky and see an event. Or there are some theories that are very optimistic theories that say that we should be seeing coalescences of black holes. And who knows, they might be right. So gravitational waves, we like to think them as audio signals because the frequency of the signals we're looking at with these detectors are in the human audio range. <laughs> and we call the signal that these binary systems make before merging a chirp because it's something like, whoop. <laughs> I'm not good at doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that goes up in pitch and amplitude until it coalesces. I think that the fact that one can use instruments of this precision to look at the structure of space-time, it's a challenge that will put science and technology at the forefront of everybody's mind. Every child, every person will be reading about this in the newspaper and saying, what? You can really measure these things with lasers and mirrors and you're talking about black holes and space-time? That's amazing. And that is the change of mind that I really want. It's, it's that amazing uh, vision of science and scientists and technology that, uh, that makes us understand the universe better. Just before leaving for Louisiana, we learned that the formal launch of Advanced LIGO, after more than a decade of development and five years of installation in the two detectors, is being pushed back. They aren't ready. All of the systems still aren't in place. 12 hours after we talked with Gabby Gonzalez, at 4.45 a.m. in Livingston Parish, on the morning of September 14th, William Parker, is in the operator's chair in the Livingston control room. He is alone that night. Natsani Kumbuchu, the operator at Hanford, also is alone. No one else is on site. Unknown to them, at 4.50 a.m. Louisiana time, the LIGO computers register a spike in data coming from both detectors and an algorithm developed over more than a decade for just this purpose, sends out an email alert to only a handful of the data analysts. 
the voice alert system that would have notified William and Natsini isn't working yet. As I understand it, and I'll preface that by saying that I, I was not involved in this particular chain of emails, but as I understand it, emails went out to three or four people, right? Marco Drago at the AEI in Hanover, Germany, Reed Essek at MIT, and Sergei Klemenko at the University of Florida. There may be one or two others who I'm not aware of. Basically, there was an email alert sent out by the algorithm itself, basically automated, saying, look, something interesting. Marco looks at it and goes, wow, this is significant. This is a very loud trigger, as we call it. This was a representation from the data. And actually, we have the two detectors in the two rows. So this is the data of the two detectors. And here, we can see in both what is the signal. And it's about, I think, 11.30 when Marco came running in. I did know that just a few days before, um, we'd had problems with the harbor injection system. So we put in signals to test the instrument. So what we did for the first 30 minutes was just try to figure out whether this was a harbor injection. It was a little bit into that when we uh, decided to just call the sites, because you can talk to the control rooms. Ed Livingston told us, you know, it was middle of the night, nothing was happening there, people had already gone home. I still thought they might have been doing a blind injection, which means that they do a test, but they don't tell anyone, just to make sure that we can detect it. We did that in the last science run, and it was six months before they told us. We had to get to the point where we wrote a paper on it. Sergei Klemenko, I think, was the next person. Sergei looked at it and said, this is not only an interesting loud trigger, it's, it has to be a binary black hole merger. When I saw the email, I kind of woke up instantly. It was kind of so beautiful that it was hard to believe it's true. You know, LIGA is a discovery instrument. It looks at this unexplored side of the universe. And therefore, it's uh, absolutely necessary to look for something surprising. And this is what I do. I like to do. And uh, I have to say that it's not very simple to, to search for unknown. It's like trying to find a black cat in a dark room. OK. And this is a big challenge. So we're adjusting all of our, our plans because we've, um, we've seen an event in the data earlier this morning. In many ways, it looks too good to be true. We're trying to keep our excitement level down that this is a real event. It was uh, 5 a.m. this morning, our time. So it's all still very new. Lots of people are looking at this. And we see this beautiful waveform in both detectors. It's so nice looking that we're so skeptical. You know, we, we of course worry that we're being pranked or, or tested somehow, but it really, really looks nice. So it would have to be malign, I would think. So we're checking off those boxes. So that leaves the quote everybody likes to use is the Sherlock Holmes quote, right? Once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, it's got to be the truth. And so we're eliminating the impossible. So then the question is, can someone or someones interfere with the data stream, either in the hardware at the detectors or in the software later, and put in a signal that looks like this? There are only, I don't know, you could count. I don't think I need my, my, my two hands to count the people who could do that. I could not do that. Um, uh, and, and these are all people we, we talk to it all the time. So uh, I, you just, we just trust. I mean, we just trust the core team of people that, that have that knowledge of the instrument. We have been working on this for decades. You know, I mean, there's this wonderful thing that goes around, you know, is there some evil genius that has laid this into us? This sort of Pandora's box of questioning, what if someone was maliciously trying to manipulate the gravitational wave signal, how might they do it? This evil genius gets to be more and more complicated and more and more skilled as you delve into this in a deeper and deeper way. So it's not just one evil genius, it's a multiple evil group of evil geniuses. One of the hypotheses was that someone could have taken a little iPod or some kind of music device and put one in Hanford and another one in Louisiana and then had some software which timed an injection to go out into electronics. In fact, two young LIGO scientists 
had just been at both detectors, at Hanford last week, and they had been working here late last night. They were here all weekend? Yeah. Before every science run, we do a set of um, ambient noise coupling checks. It takes about a week to run all over the detector and uh, blast everything we can think of, magnetically, acoustically, vibrationally, because we optimize for what hurts us the most. Is it possible that they left something at both sites? Because they were there last week, right? We have shakers and speakers and uh, big magnetic coils and, and even a pirate radio station, and we inject all of these uh, environmental signals to see what they might produce on the gravitational wave channel. We're thinking about, OK, we see a disturbance in a detector. Is it a gravitational wave, or is it just some truck on the road or something? I know, I'm just... No, because they bring They left something at both sides, it just happened. Maybe they left some timed... So on the night of September 14, that was our last day. Actually, probably September 13 was our last day, but we were um, counting the night as ours as well. Nobody was here to stop us anyway. So at 4 o'clock in the morning, we said, should we do more measurements? So we looked at our list, and one of the things we wanted to do was drive some cars around <laughs> very close to the buildings and then brake really hard every few seconds just to see if we need to limit traffic around the site. And we used um, a little GPS synchronized watch to sync our so-called injections to the data. So we say, okay, we're gonna break every five seconds, start at zero, we're gonna break six times, and then look for that comb of six kind of fingers of noise into the data. But the GPS watch had desynchronized, and it was four in the morning, and Robert had his flight probably at like 10 or noon or something. And we said, fine, you know what, this is just not that important, let's just leave. Luckily, I think, because the next day, the emails started. They were here all weekend? Yeah. Where were you? When did you leave? What were you doing? I know for sure I was on the, in the car driving at 4.35 in the morning, and the event was at 4.50, so everyone breathed a sigh of relief that I wasn't secretly climbing on something. At, uh, at the time. Matt Evans led a team that eventually would prove beyond any doubt that the detectors could not have been compromised by what they called a rogue injection. All right, hello, everybody. We've all been asking ourselves, how could this signal, which appears so perfect, have appeared and, and so loud, have appeared in the data so early in the run? And it all seems a bit improbable. So I think it's reasonable for people to ask, was it somehow faked? In the process of investigating for uh, rogue injections, I went through and talked to people all the way along the chain. And what I found was that everywhere I looked along the way, there was somebody who had actually taken great care to make a very secure system. Turns out the data spreads from the interferometer very quickly, and so it's hard to add anything consistently through all the copies that exist. And the security, actually, on the computer systems is quite high, which I didn't expect for a science project. So by the end, I was thoroughly convinced that it would have required some large internal conspiracy of evil geniuses to pull this thing off. I think it's really verges on crazy to think that this was injected. Uh, I didn't feel that way when I started the investigation. I thought there were ways it could have been faked. The idea this might have been a blind injection or some sort of you know, rogue injection, some hack of the system, it wasn't that. But Anna Maria and Robert's clandestine night at Livingston will become one of the legends of LIGO not because they turned out to be Weiss and Evans' elusive evil geniuses, but because, had they not stopped working only 15 minutes before the signal arrived, history might have been very different. What we had been planning on doing would have taken us right across the time when we made the detection, which was only, I think, like 50 minutes after we stopped. It would have meant that people weren't looking for that signal because we essentially say, hey, we're injecting now, don't believe anything you see. Had they had a burst of energy late at night, 
um, uh, they, they, they might have continued working through the time when the signal came. That would have been a pity because we wouldn't have been able to claim a detection if they had been up to no good at the time in making injections. So the idea of the event is we don't talk about the event outside of the collaboration. We're trying to keep a secret, if you want to call it that, with a thousand people. So we're inevitably going to get rumors and there probably will be some questions. They might be unexpected. I thought, you know, I keep thinking that somebody will say, oh wait, I found something, it's not, it's not a real event. This is looking more and more real. So this could be the real thing. It was either a double secret committee that is <coughs> testing us all or this is a, or this is a, a, a real thing. I think everybody has heard that chirp noise and, and all the people that have made the chirp noise. This is a time frequency and it goes boop. It's a chirp. It's very speculative right now. A lot of people don't believe this because it looks so good. The degree of reality has gone up and up, and so it'll be very, very bad if we find out that this is something, you know, that, you know. So I'm, I'm just now looking at the chat windows. Everyone is typing very fast. We've looked in a lot of the obvious places already, and we don't see that. And so right now we're in this unplanned mode of essentially freezing status. And um, rather than have to apologize for what we do months from now, it would be good to know now whether people are confident writing a paper with more data. This is the time to, to do the math, I think. But it's new territory. We have an event. We have uh, hundreds of people looking at the event. People are going to look for any kind of way to, to poke holes in this. There's going to be a lot of devil's advocacy going on over the next uh, couple of months, especially for something this big. You would say, what if we're wrong? What, what if it's a mistake? When you're detecting something or claiming to detect something that's never been seen before, you have to have a certain degree of certainty. If this was the 10th event we were seeing, maybe we wouldn't care so much. We know they're out there. Maybe we can live with an un, you know, a, a lower confidence le a, a level. But for the first one, you've just got to be sure that this, is, this didn't occur due to some other artifact, that this is really a message from nature. You worry that in any complicated experiment like this, that you may have made a discovery, but you're not sure that the discovery is really true. And I mean, there's many situations in my life where that's happened. You know your apparatus better than anybody else. How could it, you know, what could mess it up? The main thing we're concerned with is just sealing off all the avenues of doubt, which of course in science you do by being your own worst enemy. A gravitational wave detection is a in some sense a statistical statement, all right? There's a possibility, for example, that, that the interferometers could misbehave in such a way that that particular signal could show up almost simultaneously on both interferometers. So the job of the data analysts is now to understand how often that happens, all right? With what frequency we might expect a, a false event to show up and look like a real event. So the real challenge now, now everybody's scrambling to try and vet this candidate to, to look at it and in some sense the job of the, the people that are uh, analyzing the data is to try and kill it, all right? They want to do everything they can to prove that this is not a real event and if all of their efforts fail, then it becomes something that we would announce to the world as gravitational wave detection. Good morning, everyone. I'm coming here at a time when everything's kind of crazy in, in many ways, so I appreciate you taking an hour out of your, uh, your busy lives to, uh, to listen to something that I think is, is pretty important, but it's really, really an exciting time, and I think everybody in this room uh, should be pretty happy about all the hard work that they've put in to get us here. So this is something that I took from the Dechar summary pages, and this is certainly getting everyone's attention. What you're looking at is the first possible detection of a gravitational wave, and this was a signal that came into the Livingston detector Sunday morning. There's still a long way to go. 
before we call this a gravitational wave signal. One of the questions that has come up, many of you know we have this thing called a blind injection challenge where there's a team of people that surreptitiously inject signals into the detector. I have been asked a number of times, is this a blind injection, a double super secret blind injection? The answer is no. This is not a blind injection. No one on my authority, on Gabby's authority, on the authority of anybody in the senior management of the LIGO laboratory did this. So this could be the real deal, all right? I think we're still all coming to terms with the fact that we have seen a gravitational wave. Um, for many of us, um, it, it's something that we've been waiting for for decades and decades, and it almost had taken on a mythical uh, sense that, hey, will it ever happen? Oh, it probably will, but it won't be tomorrow or the next day. It'll be next year or five years later. And to see that we've actually crossed that threshold is something that still gives me a shiver of pleasure when I wake up in the morning and still gives me a shiver of fright that we've fooled ourselves in some way. I don't think it's hit me yet. If the true and profound implications of the September 14th candidate were slow to sink in among the many hundreds of LIGO engineers and scientists, understandable because they risked their careers on finding just such a highly theoretical and impossibly faint detection. There was one young physicist at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Potsdam, Germany, for whom there would be nothing theoretical or intuitively challenging about the candidate. September 14th was Sergei Osakin's first day in his new postdoctoral fellowship in numerical relativity. The field whose calculations, using Einstein's equations, are our only way to understand the last few violent, chaotic moments of a binary black hole or neutron star collision. I came in and, uh, of course, met everyone, all the postdocs, uh, etc., got acquainted, uh, talked to the director, Alessandra, and then uh, she told me to, uh, to come to my office. I tried to explain to him also the importance of the confidentiality before even telling him the story. Uh, and at the end, I told him we might have detected um, a very interesting signal. I was almost immediately asked, would you be willing to do numerical simulations if we think that this is correct? Um, I was thrilled, but also a bit anxious, of course. <laughs> He took the work uh, beautifully, and he started uh, soon after the simulation to run the first simulation. So I was, of course, one of uh, many people uh, who did so, part of a big collaboration, which has this numerical relativity code that hundreds of people have contributed to. We know that numerical relativity takes some time to run on a supercomputer. Depending on the configuration, it can be anywhere between weeks and months before you have an answer. Of course, numerically, I mean, if you solve it on a computer, the only output is just numbers. This is so far the only way to really understand what happens around the moment of merger and afterwards. And to understand it better, intuitively, we decided to make some animations. So the movies, in principle, are based on numerical relativity simulations. So this is really the simulation. This is really the data. This is what it hopefully will look like and hopefully will be seen. The problem with these computations is that the computations just produce millions of numbers. And there's no way for the human brain to absorb these millions of numbers and understand what's going on without some sort of uh, visual aid. And that's why the movies are made. They're not just made for, for non-scientists to ooh and ah over. They're made in order to enable the physicist, the researcher, to comprehend what's going on. If we hadn't had computer simulations that told us what the predictions are for this domain, we wouldn't have had any confidence in understanding the observations because you could not compute those waves uh, emitted from that first uh, merger using any technique except brute force numerical relativity on a computer. It really helped spur the field of numerical relativity and getting people to take Einstein's equations and to put them into software and simulate what would happen when two black holes collide of different masses, two neutron stars, black hole, neutron star, and so forth. Without those simulations, we wouldn't have a clue what those waveforms meant. 
Um, and but it's they they have so much information in them, and they have information because of the mathematics and the computation. The way that Einstein's equations are written in textbooks is not the way that you can actually solve them easily on a computer. Uh, the problem with Einstein's is it's more like 50 equations that you're dealing with. There were tremendous obstacles, both in terms of understanding Einstein's equations well enough to be able to solve them on a computer without uh, having the, com the computations blow up. So in terms of understanding the mathematics, but also in terms of the coding, you're trying to compute not how something behaves in space and time, but how space-time itself behaves when it's highly nonlinear, highly dynamical. We're building a catalog of simulations of black hole collisions that tell us just precisely what is the shape of the wave, the so-called waveform. That catalog then will enable us to look at an observed waveform and say, yes, that was a black hole where this black hole has a mass 10 times the mass of the sun, that one has a mass 17 times the mass of the sun. The issue of reverse engineering, of seeing some waveforms and figuring out what's going on in them, that's going to be exceedingly difficult, and we don't know how to do that yet. Because we don't know in advance what the masses of those black holes are going to be, we have to generate a bank of templates that spans that space, that have many, many combinations of masses, so we'll have a template that is close enough to any possible signal we might get in the data that the search pipelines can accurately recover it. To do that means that we have to generate these templates quickly and in the software. We can't do that with numerical relativity because it would be too expensive. So instead, we use pencil and paper methods, and that allows us to generate very accurate waveforms. But it's not perfect. It's not a complete model. It's not the full general relativity solution. It's, it's a close approximation to it. So the model search that found the event used uh, on the order of 200,000 templates. So the last two weeks have been really pretty exciting, you know, from the time when these online searches picked up this very loud trigger. You know, we've been through a whole series of exercises to figure out what this was, and many of them, underlying them, are self-doubt. We're like, could we have caused this by our own ignorance or anything from accidents to, you know, to malpractice? And that's every check we've done has kind of come back saying, no, this really came from some astrophysical origin, we believe. And so then you start almost believing it. And that's pretty cool. The real difficulty with making the first discovery was the history of, I think there's probably been something like 15 papers published over the 50 years that we're talking about, where claims to have seen gravitational waves have been made and all of them have gone into the waste bin. And for that reason, for these 50 years, the gravitational wave detection physics, or terrestrial gravitational wave detection physics, has been a sort of orphan field. Everybody thinks that the people in it are, are idiots. They're doing something impossible. And year after year, they demonstrate that it's impossible. And meantime, they've got people who are claiming to have seen the things and haven't seen them. So it's had a very bad reputation. And so the whole field knows, knew, that to make the first discovery, they really had to do it right. <laughs> um, well, there, there, was, there was a moment when I basically broke down in tears with the happiness of it all. And there, it was a precise moment. It was the, the so-called box opening ceremony. We're going to listen to the compact binary coalescence group who collected their data together in this little snippet of an observation run. And they've done two things. They've looked at the data when there's no gravitational wave signal. And they've also looked at the same times for the two detectors. And this foreground measurement, where you look at the synchronized data from the two instruments, that's where a signal shows up. So well, the collaboration, I, among others, are really impatient to see what's in the box. Um, and so we're going to probably open the box today. The first thing we're going to do, though, um, at 11, another half hour or so, is look at the closed box. We'll talk about whether or not we understand the statistics of the detector data to date well enough to draw any conclusions from what we see. The opening of the box is a process of them actually just 
walking over to their computer, clicking on a button and opening this data file and looking to see what it says. So if, if there's nothing sort of further to say on, on, on that, I, I will hand directly over to... We actually broke the teleconferencing software that day because it was set up to take 50 people and 400 people joined. And Alex Nitz will walk through the open box page, and then we have a discussion of what we do about possible quieter events in the uh, in the data. The thing which I think is really maybe electrifying here is that there may be other events in the data. There's always gravitational waves in our data. Um, this event is an extremely loud one, but the further you go away in space, the more sources there are. These sources are constantly producing gravitational waves, and these are constantly in our data. The problem is, to this point, the noise. Uh, of the detector, the terrestrial noise, the noise of Earth, has been loud enough that it covers up these these events. For people who aren't regular CBC or GAC attendees, this is the primary uh, offline deep search for neutron star black hole, binary black hole, and binary neutron star binaries. It in the next few years, I expect that LIGO and Virgo will detect many more of this uh, event, either black hole, black hole, hopefully also neutron star black hole, neutron star, neutron star. From each of these sources, we can learn something different about the universe, about nuclear matter in extreme condition, general relativity, and so on and so forth. So when this happens, I, I think the most important uh, you know, fact will be the transition between uh, finding gravitational waves, which is what we are doing now, what people have rightly focused on, on, on the last several years, OK, to so from finding gravitational waves to doing something with gravitational waves, which is the exciting part, OK? To prepare for the box opening, we wanted to go back and have a, a high-level review of the entire code. So the review started about uh, over a year ago. The things that are the most kind of rewarding are, some, are sometimes the things that are the simplest. And that's you know kind of the opposite of what people think is interesting. I started out with things like trying to stabilize lasers very precisely and trying to build electronics that have very, very low noise and things like that. But some of the really most difficult stuff is kind of the dumb stuff, like vacuum, getting a good enough vacuum for the beams to go through, getting a good enough vacuum so the mirrors don't get t contaminated. I spent a huge amount of time on that, and that is really, really hard because it's got all kinds of things the history of the steel, it's got all this kind of stuff that you just can't control well enough. And it falls into one of these domains that it's sort of a black art. Uh, we are signing off on being okay with the box being opened. So during the telecon, uh, you know, people were just sort of presenting um, the, the background or the work that they had done to come up with the background estimates they had come up with. And then when everybody's confident, yeah, that looks good, I don't see any real, you know, errors or issues with the way you set up your analysis. Pipeline A, yeah, it looks good. Same kind of thing, pipeline B, yeah, that looks good. Then everybody says, okay, now that we're all satisfied with the way you set up your analysis, we're ready to actually see what your analysis has come up with. And that's the opening the box part. The box opening is that we've reached a strong consensus that we're ready to open the boxes with no major objections from the folks on the call. Then, yeah, we, we said, okay, we're ready. Let's take one final round of questions from anyone on any of the, the things you've heard so far. We asked for objections, does anyone have any reason why we shouldn't be looking at this? And everyone said no, so we went ahead. I guess now, unless there are any objections, we can go ahead with, with the box opening. So, and Alex Nitz, if, if you could take us through then the, the opening. We, we flipped the switch. Three different bins. So there was like a precise yeah, moment, we could probably time it to the second, when everyone saw how, how strong the signal was compared with the noise then we could scroll down to one particular graph, a histogram of the strength of this signal versus the strength of all possible noise events shown in such a way that you could see how unlikely it was that noise made this. And we'd all had enough practice at box openings. We knew exactly what criterion would say. There's not even one chance in a million that noise was responsible for the signal. And that's the standard that physicists have developed for saying, OK, if it's better than one chance in a million, it's all right to say it's real. You found it. And it was right there. It was like, it was like a dream.
So when the box opened today, well, there were two boxes. So you know, the first box was opened and there was the event, loud as can be. But my eyes went immediately to all the events below it because we expect somehow that nature wouldn't give us just this one loud event, but that'd be the whole, this whole popcorn of smaller, less loud events lurking about. And there wasn't much evidence of that. So I was thrilled the event was there, and I was a little disappointed that I was the only one. This is a little bit spooky, but we have to make one step at a time, take what nature gives us, and uh, but keep those questions alive. You know, I, look, to be honest with you, what's the disappointment? Why do I have a disappointment? It's not just me. Everybody in the room is very proud that it was there. But the thing many of us were looking for is the fact that, my God, if you have this very sensitive way of looking for this, there should be a population of all of these things. They're not just, you know, why only one of them? I think this is one of the biggest mysteries that we have to actually solve in the, in the coming weeks to months to maybe years. I don't know how long it'll take before we see more events and can start understanding what does nature really have out there? You know, right now we've seen one event. It's tantalizing, it's actually magnificent, it's loud, it's a, it's a, a, a system that we haven't seen before. So nothing could be better except if we had more of them. No, but I think the, the discovery isn't the measurement of the gravitational waves. I have to tell you that. The black holes. It's the black holes. Yeah. That's absolutely spectacular. I, I know. It's like completely. <laughs> and not just like yeah. solar massy ones, but no. tens of solar massy ones. This exists, and it, if you look, see a couple more, or if I even, and then you could say something about the universe. It's something new we're going to be able to say about the universe, which is spectacular. Yeah. To me, that's the big discovery. But it's then it's going to be hard to say, well, but the universe only has one of these. <laughs> I think the remarkable thing is not so much that we saw a gravitational wave. I mean, that's remarkable enough, but it isn't the real centerpiece of this whole discovery. Uh, that centerpiece is the fact that we saw a particular source that nature seems to have given us, which a lot of us have thought about over the years. It's the best source we could have imagined. It's the source that says Einstein is right on every goddamn detail, almost. In other words, it's, it, this is a source that doesn't require any other physics than general relativity. Let's think of that. The idea of LIGO came to me in a course where I was trying to explain to the students general relativity. And I barely knew anything. I mean, they knew more than I did in most of the course. There was a revolution going on in the whole idea of gravitation in the early 60s, and I wanted to be part of it. And because I had spent time at Princeton, they thought I knew something about general relativity, which was absurd. The trouble was, I couldn't admit to the guy who asked me to teach general relativity here at MIT that I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I came to MIT with this whole big program of doing things in gravity. And then to admit that I didn't know what the, the hell the theory was about was probably more than I should have admitted, right? So I, I was one day ahead of the students, or in many, in many cases, just about equal with the students. So it was an interesting term, let me tell you. <laughs> and I learned a lot. Ray did an analysis of all the noise sources that such a gravity wave detector would have to deal with. Basically created a blueprint for the future, but it is probably the most powerful paper of its sort that, that I've ever read in terms of a vision for the future. And this is 1972, after he's been thinking about this for a few years. In the summer of 1988, Kip Thorne, after a number of years, convinced me to move to Caltech to take on this type of research. And we took a lot of great work that had been done long before I joined and used that understanding to write the construction proposal to build this big gigantic monumental thing and we faced all the problems of you know trying to get NSF to bet the farm on on this which is what they did very brave people took this on uh, a project that was you know 10 times bigger than anything NSF had ever done before uh, very high risk the 1989 proposal was written by Ravi Vogt who had been a provost of Caltech and came on as the LIGO project director. He was joined by Kip, Ray, Fred Robb, and Ron Drever, 
who had been a leader of the important Glasgow Gravitational Wave Group and had come to Caltech to join Kip and Ray as one of the founders of LIGO. And then what happened was that uh, there was a significant falling out between Ron Drever and Robbie Vogt, which is most unfortunate. So what happened is that caused all sorts of hell to break out loose. It was in every newspaper that this terrible thing had happened to the LIGO project. It got busted up. The director of the NSF informed the Congress that uh, they were halting, interrupting the funding uh, for the project, which is a very serious act. And they told the, uh, the Caltech that uh, the leadership of uh, LIGO needed to be changed. So Barry was asked uh, to be the uh, new director of LIGO. Barry was a absolute breath of fresh air in the sense that he had been through it. He'd been through the SSC. He knew how to run a big project. He knew how to deal with people. He just knew exactly what he needed, and little by little, the thing took on the feeling of a real project. I think it's quite clear that if Barry hadn't come along and brought his talents and skills to LIGO, it would have crashed and burned. We were in a, in a crisis. We were approved in 1994 to build LIGO, and uh, it took five years to do the physical building, which is maybe only a year longer than I thought. It took five years to make it work, which is five years longer than I thought, really because it's very, very difficult and there was no precedent. At that time, we knew that the technology didn't exist. It would have to be invented. Advanced LIGO uses uh, glass, which is uh, so beautiful. I, I don't even have an analogy for it, but it's so purely made that if you set it to ringing, not that you would do this, but if you whacked it like this, it would ring a hundred million times before it stopped vibrating. And, and that's because it's so pure, the energy doesn't go anywhere. It has been a long, hard um, struggle to get to this sensitivity. It's not been easy. We've pushed the boundaries of technology in several different areas, with lasers, with optics, suspensions, and probably lots of other areas. The hardest thing about advanced LIGO is the, just the sheer complexity of the device. We're <laughs> we're where I, where I thought we'd be maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> the dream of every scientist is to break through a barrier to be able to see for the first time things people couldn't do before, you know, and, and so moments like that or, you know, the first look through a telescope, the first look through a microscope, and, and for us the first touching of space and time, if you will. We've talked about the displacement of the arms and how small it is. That might make you think that the event is very weak, but when the signal reaches us, it does produce this tiny distortion in space-time. And part of that is because the source is so distant. But nonetheless, it carries a lot of energy, this gravitational wave. The actual source of these two roughly 30 solar mass black holes, and in the final last milliseconds of that system's life, the black holes are racing around each other, distorting up space-time, merging and forming another black hole, and in the process, converts about three times the mass of our sun, three solar masses, in about two-tenths of a second into gravitational wave energy. So that makes it, we think, the most energetic astrophysical object ever detected. Take every star in the universe, add up all of its power that it produces, in every galaxy, so I'm talking about the whole universe here. The event that we saw on September 14th was 50 times, 50 times more powerful. Basically, the universe got 50 times brighter all right, in gravitational waves during that brief instant where, where it came together. If you imagine that every star in the universe had a planet orbiting around it that was similar to the Earth, there's about, I think there's about a billion galaxies in the universe. There's about a billion stars in each one of those galaxies. So if each one of them had an Earth orbiting it, and if each of those Earths, if the populations on those used about as much energy as the Earth's population used in 2014 in every form, this single event that gave us this little burst that lasted a fraction of a second put out enough energy to supply the, all of those Earths 
for over a billion years. We've done something different than has been done before, right? We measure direct. This is certainly the first time that we've seen the stretching and squeezing of space-time due to a passing gravitational wave, or any other effect for that matter. It's the first time we've had instruments sensitive enough to make that measurement, and it's the first time we've been fortunate to have a source that had the force needed to make the signal that we could measure. What we've never had until LIGO is any information whatsoever, observationally, about this uh, highly, highly dynamical warping of space and time associated with these gravitational waves. There you see the black holes going around each other. It's a beautiful display of gravitational lensing as they go around each other. They're going to collide and merge into one black hole, and they're getting close. The collision and merger is extremely violent, but you don't see the violence so much in this movie. The collision has occurred, it's ended, gravitational waves were emitted and they're traveling to Earth. To really see what was going on, you have to go up into a higher dimension, go up into the fifth dimension, look in on the warped space in the orbital plane of the black holes. Here are the black holes, these funnels, the color coding as before represents the slowing of time. And uh, these are the this is the gravitational waveform that is being emitted. You see the blue point is where it is on the shape of the waves of stretching and squeezing. And we're going to watch the warping of space become very extreme and of time become very extreme during the merger. I'll pause it completely at the moment of merger. That's what it looks like at the moment of merger, tremendously warped space and time. About half the stars you see in the night sky are actually binaries, pairs of stars revolving around each other. And so people thought there may be binary black holes in the universe. They had never been detected before. But this is what was detected on September 14th. It's a significant event, let's put it this way. And nobody has this yet dissuaded us of that. That's the elegant part of it. These theories are pretty extreme. Black holes are very extreme. There are all these kind of spooky aspects of the black holes, which from a physics perspective, makes them fascinating, a little terrifying. So a black hole is an object that's not made from matter like you and I. It's uh, made from warped space and warped time. And yet it uh, is a, a interesting richness of structure like you have in things that are made from matter. When two black holes collide, they create a real storm in the fabric of space and time with wildly oscillating rate of flow of time, with vortices of twisting space. We're essentially seeing them up close. 1509-14 was an event where we took two of these and we crashed them into each other at almost the speed of light. That's a really good way to figure out you know, what they're made out of and whether they really are what you think they are. And they are, they, they are. They, they, they're exactly what Einstein said they should be. Unbelievable, you can't ask for more. It's the vindication of everything. It was this massive cataclysmic event billions of light years away in space. Um, these two massive, dense, giant objects in space, they were black holes, billions of years old probably. Each one weighed more than 30 solar masses. They were hundreds of kilometers apart, revolving around each other hundreds of times a second until a third of a second late, not, not even time to blink. They, they collided, they were brighter than the rest of the universe. It was the most cataclysmic event that I can think of. In mid-October, a second, far weaker signal sweeps through the two detectors. When we got that second weak signal, that's when I really finally accepted oh my goodness, there is actually a population of binary black holes out there, and this is happening for real, and we're making real discoveries. We're opening a brand new field of astronomy. We're discovering binary black holes that electromagnetic astronomy could never have seen before, and the only way to discover this population is through gravitational waves. And I'm part of this historic discovery, and I just couldn't believe this was actually happening and, and I was experiencing it. It is definitely another candidate, but it doesn't meet LIGO's threshold of one chance in a million being a false alarm. The second signal 
was never claimed at, as a strong detection. And the reason is that October event had a roughly 85% probability of being astrophysical. And that sounds like a high probability. On the other hand, that leaves about 15% probability that it is noise. And from a scientific point of view, 15% probability of this being noise is too high. We discovered for the first time a pair of two black holes colliding we opened a brand new field of astronomy and we're making this claim based on one source that nobody has ever seen before, no independent other team has seen, and no other team can ever see again because this signal reached our detectors, it lasted 0.2 seconds and it's gone. Nobody can come a year later, look at that part of the sky and say, oh yeah, I see that signal too, because that signal is gone. So we were in a position of having to make this amazing claim, changing the field of astronomy the way we know it, and, and all based on one source. So what do you do? The October event is not claimed as a detection. Even though LIGO faces the prospect of announcing to the world its first detection without having found another, a prospect many in the collaboration view with very real concern. But then, a week after our interview with Mike Landry at Hanford, Christmas night in the US, or Boxing Day in Europe, the two photodiodes at both detectors light up within just over a millisecond of each other. And LIGO makes a second verifiable detection. You know, it wasn't 100% sure, it wasn't even 90% sure that we should have another. But when we got the second one, we all said, oh, <laughs> this is for real. <laughs> I mean, we all felt not just excited, but relieved too. It's difficult to describe that because everything was different, but also so reassuring. <laughs> so the second detection really tells us the first detection wasn't a one-off thing. It wasn't lucky, it wasn't a fluke. We can see these things with LIGO. LIGO is real. We're, we're no longer a physics experiment detecting a gravitational wave. We're doing astronomy. That's, that's a transition to a new world. Kip Thorne wrote in his book on the science of the movie Interstellar, a film he was instrumental in creating. When the shape of space is oscillating wildly and the rate of flow of time is oscillating wildly, for me, this is a fascinating frontier of knowledge. LIGO is now on that frontier. I thought it, I was in a dream. <laughs> it was just uh, fantastic. I cannot uh, yet believe it. Um, for five months, we kept this secret. And um, during the last few days, I was thinking, I don't want to give it away uh, because it was so nice to just uh, have it there and explore it and look at it and analyze it. Um, but I think it's the right time now to, you know, let it go and so that other people can know about this. Good morning. Without a doubt, the reason so many of us are here today is because we believe in the potential of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave <coughs> Observatory. Opening a new observational window would allow us to see our universe and some of the most violent phenomena within it in an entirely new way. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. I am so pleased to be able to tell you that. Jack, that's why it's called. Really, really exciting. I couldn't be more excited. Uh, my flight got canceled last night, so I was stuck down in New Orleans, and I thought, I could rent a car, I could get here. <laughs> and one of the fellows next to me on the, in the waiting area says, oh, but you'll fall asleep. I said, oh, no, I won't. 
oh, I have waited 22 years for this. I am not going to fall asleep. The frequencies of these waveforms are in the human hearing range. We can hear gravitational waves. We can hear the universe. Now, I wanted to play the gravitational wave for you to hear. Did you hear the chirp? There's a rumbling noise, and then there's a chirp. That's the chirp we've been looking for. We're seeing something that has never been seen before. And today, a lot of people's dreams have come true. What we do is we suspend the mirrors from a pendulum. Here is a sort of demonstration pendulum. And here's the mirror, and my hand will be the ground motion. And you notice if I move it very slowly or at low frequencies, the pendulum follows me. It follows the ground motion completely. Now let me wiggle it fast. And you'll notice the pendulum stands still while I'm wiggling. That's the basis of the idea. Now that's done with a tremendous elegance and, uh, you know, with cunning in this picture. This is what's actually in the apparatus. You see it on the screen now, OK? And by the way, the principle I just showed you is very much like the principle in a car. It makes you comfortable in a Cadillac and sort of bumpy in a truck. Okay? <laughs> Light and black holes are not the only source of gravitational waves that light will see. We will see gravitational waves from spinning neutron stars, stars the size of Washington, D.C., made of pure nuclear matter, weighing more than the sun, with little mountains on their surfaces that uh, as the uh, stars spin, those mountains generate continuous gravitational waves, long-lasting gravitational waves. We'll see gravitational waves from black holes tearing neutron stars apart, gravitational waves from neutron stars colliding. We are searching for gravitational waves from the central core engines of supernova explosions. And amazingly, we're searching for gravitational waves and have some hope of finding them from cosmic strings, giant strings that reach across the universe. Einstein would be beaming, wouldn't he? This is uh, uh, obviously a very, very special moment. It's a very special moment for me personally to be able to uh, hug a faculty mentor when I was a graduate student at Caltech and hearing uh, Kip and Virginia Trimble, the uh, spouse of Joseph Weber, inspire uh, students with stories of black holes, which seemed imaginary at the time and look look where we've come now just amazing so this thing stood out like a sore thumb and that made us all and me certainly suspicious personally i wanted to represent the engineers and physicists who are female and strong and bright and and i wanted to stand up for girl power You know, this represents our 16 days of coincident data at the start of the run, and you get one source that, that's a real home run, and then imagine an instrument much more sensitive that's supposed to run for six months, let's say. You know, we're not going to know what to do with it. Nine months later, LIGO began its second observing run. But by July 2017, 22 months after the first detection, the euphoria of February's historic announcement and its wide international media coverage had faded a bit. And it had also given way to a disquiet, even fear, for LIGO's future. There had been another detection of colliding black holes back in January, an event nearly three billion light years away and then one in June, but nothing more. And the detectors were plagued by unexpected setbacks, unanticipated flaws in the high power laser, and disturbingly in the mirrors. And then there were the whims of nature and even unexplained mysteries. We almost blew it. We were gonna shut off our detectors in June of 2017. And a decision was made to, after a lot of careful consideration, a decision was made to run through August. And that decision was influenced by a number of things, one of which was we wanted to run with Virgo and have you know, Virgo be able to say, OK, you know, they participated in O2. I think that was very, very important for them. 
Virgo is the three kilometer Italian French interferometer outside of Pisa. Its second generation, advanced Virgo, was late coming online. It was now scheduled to launch in early August, joining for just a few weeks LIGO's second run before its planned shutdown on August 25th. With multiple detectors about the globe, they will be seen in one detector first, another second, another third. And that time of arrival allows you to triangulate where that object would exist in the sky. And the promise of, of doing that and localizing it in the sky means that we can follow up with other observational instruments, light telescopes, radio waves, X-rays, gamma rays. But LIGO's difficulties weren't over. On July 6th, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake in Montana hit the Hanford detector. Hanford was not only knocked offline, it suffered damage that could not easily be explained or quickly be repaired. Hanford is broken at some level. I mean, it's, uh, it's not performing anywhere near it's where it should be performing. We don't completely know why yet, and so we're going to have a lot of work to do. That's what we've been talking about, right? Yep. Virgo went ahead and came online three weeks later, on August 1st. And then, amazingly, in further proof that LIGO was on a truly charmed roll, on August 14th, Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo made the first three-way gravitational wave detection. And that was only the prelude. On August 17th, just a week before LIGO's second run was coming to an end, the spectacular happened. What we know is there was this you know, loud ping in the gravitational wave detectors at the same time as there was this burst of gamma rays and this bright thing came up in the optical and is now fading. And that's what we know at this point. A month earlier, Virgo wouldn't have been part of this. We would have had a large area of the sky and we might have missed it. A short two months later, Franz Cordova and Dave Reitze took the world stage again at the National Press Club in Washington. Today, we're thrilled to announce that scientists have detected gravitational waves coming from the collision of two neutron stars, the smallest and densest stars. This event occurred 130 million light years from Earth in a galaxy far away. We have, for the first time, seen both gravitational waves and light from the collision of two dense dead stars called neutron stars. However, to do it this time, we join forces with thousands of astronomers and many, many observatories. So we saw a signal at 8.41 AM Eastern Time on August 17th. The signal was much different from the black holes that we had detected before. It was much longer. We analyzed this signal, and what we found was that it was a neutron star, approximately 1.6 solar masses, colliding with a second neutron star, approximately 1.1 solar masses. So this graphic that you're seeing here is just the brief second where they collided. Binary neutron star systems have been predicted for decades, and we knew that we would see them. What makes this event so amazing is what came next. The emission of light across the entire electromagnetic spectrum revealed to us by a campaign involving 70 observatories, including seven space-based observatories and every continent on the planet. So if you look at the graphic carefully that I'm showing, you'll even see there's a dot in Antarctica. So this is quite dramatic. We were able to identify it quickly and then have astronomical partners following it up. You know, here we are, they happen once a day somewhere in the universe, and we don't really understand how, you know, what, what the inner engine is. You know, what's really powering them? They're tremendously bright. We see them to the edge of the universe, just this burst of light. Where, you know, where is it coming from? And the gravitational waves teach us. The gravitational waves let us, in effect, peer in right to the heart of them. And that's what we're doing. So we've now looked right to the heart of one of these things. And we can tell you, you know, it's definitely these two objects colliding. And that's what caused it. They collided. Two seconds later, there was this burst of gamma rays. So, I mean, that's, that's remarkable that we've had that. We've never had a picture like that before, where we're looking to the very inside of the event. Now, let me tell you, what we saw were two neutron stars, which are stars that are the weight of the sun, about the weight of the sun about the size of Manhattan, 
Okay? That means you're dealing with something that's enormously dense. And a teaspoon of it, if you stuck it in, the, in that material, would weigh millions of tons. You couldn't lift it. Astronomers have thought for a long time that the collisions of these neutron stars produce heavy elements. And there's been hints of that. As these neutron stars come together, you begin to see that it looks like maybe all, maybe not all, but certainly most of the very heavy elements are made in those collisions of two neutron stars. Like, for example, platinum, gold, lead, uranium. They just didn't easily make in stars. And that, people had guessed at that before. But now they really saw that it was two neutron stars. They got that from the, from the gravitational wave research. This is my great-grandfather's uh, gold watch. It's about 100 years old. The gold in this watch was very likely produced in the collision of two neutron stars approximately billions of years ago. We don't know exactly when. The universe has been expanding since the Big Bang, and the bigger it gets, the faster it expands. The Hubble constant is the quantity that sets the scale for this expansion. And astronomers have been trying to pin down this number for more than 80 years. What LIGO and Virgo have done using this latest data is to introduce a new method completely independent. This is a method that was first uh, proposed 30 years ago by Professor Bernard Schutz, who's here in the audience with us today. Yeah, that was something I did in 1986. So we've been waiting for a long time to be able to apply it. <laughs> At the time, it was a very big thing in astronomy to measure the rate of expansion of the universe. And I realized that we had another tool for measuring the Hubble constant. So that was what I wrote in my paper. Here's how to measure distances, and here's how to, how to use it to measure the expansion rate of the universe. So ever since then, I've been waiting. <laughs> Each of those individual discoveries is a big deal. Putting them all together just transforms that discovery. I think there's no doubt at this point this is by far the most studied astronomical event ever in the history of the universe. Uh, you know, well, that's very Earth-centric, certainly in the history of our human civilization. This binary neutron star event is gonna tell us things for the next 10 years, this wonderful event. You know, it's sort of like, you know, in two years, we're once again changing scientific history. Professor Weiss, Professor Barish, Professor Thorne. You have been awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize for Physics for your decisive contributions to the detector of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory and for the observation of gravitational waves. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, it's my honor and my great pleasure to convey to you our warmest congratulations. So the first thing that people should realize is... Nutriment, this is about, this really is about the curiosity, the ingenuity, the creativity of the best that the human species have to offer. So that is the beautiful story that you have enabled us to celebrate tonight and tomorrow. Let me just focus on Ray for a moment. Partly because he's the reason I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> or partly because I want to say, I don't know a most humble human being on the face of the planet. But Ray one day needs to understand and Kit described that story beautifully yesterday, that without him, we wouldn't have been here. You started this. And yes, it took someone smart like you to smart someone perhaps even smarter like you, like that guy, <laughs> to convince him that this is worth pursuing. And you assembled an amazing team, including Barry and the rest of you, to accomplish an amazing and unachievable goal. 
So, Ray, one of these days, you just have to accept, <laughs> accept that you received a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I now ask you to step forward to receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. In 2007, Barry was given an honorary PhD degree by the University of uh, Florida. He came and he gave this wonderful talk, a very commanding presentation, and uh, at the end of it, I have to remind you at this time, 2007, the United States was deeply involved in the Iraq War, and it wasn't going well for the United States. One of my senior colleagues, a very distinguished physicist himself, a gentleman by the name of uh, John Clowder, comes up to me and says, Dave, that guy Barry Barish, if he were, were leading the Iraq war, it would be over. <laughs> of scientists to get us where we are is, of course, a sign that it was not easy. The field has had supporters who kept it going through those four decades. But, of course, not everybody was a supporter. We had a little bit about Man Barry's talk again. And in Scotland, we have a drinking toast for such occasions, <laughs> which I thought I would read out to you. <laughs> May those who love us love us. And those that don't love us May God turn their hearts. <laughs> and if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so we will know them by their own <laughs> Kip, in his talk yesterday, was inspiring about the future, about where we are going after this discovery. So on behalf of the generations of scientists to come who are going to be able to take advantage of that, Thank you to the laureates for all the work that they've done in getting us to the point that we are tonight. Thank you. In terms of Nobel Week, it's hard if you ask me, you know, what's the most meaningful part of that? sitting next to the queen, which I did, or, or walking with this beautiful princess, or all this, that's all great fun. It's hard to say that anything's more meaningful than the actual ceremony where you're handed the medal and document, the certificate by the king. But I would say that another part of it actually got to me much more and was totally unanticipated. The ceremony, Afterwards, what people don't realize is they come up and they take away your medal and take away your certificate, uh, not for good, but because you're not, they don't want you to lose it. Each of us have an appointment where you went to the Nobel Foundation offices, and one of the things, you sit down and you know, they give you the medal and this and that. And then a book opened up to a page that had uh, a 2017 on the top, and you just signed it. So there was nothing else but signing it except that if you look back at the page before, it was 2016, the page before that, 2015, and so forth. So I could look back to see Feynman's signature or uh, Bohr or Shelley Glashow or anybody that I knew. To actually feel that I'm in the same book as these guys was, uh, had a huge uh, impact kind of emotionally on me. It was paging back, which I did, that uh, really got to me. We have a question uh, from our webcast or overflow room here. Yes, we have about 90,000 watching via webcast. And it's actually a question that's been echoed throughout the web. The question's about what that means for us here on Earth, and will this bring us further in the science of things like time travel and high-speed traveling? 
Oh, Kip, this is Taylor made for you. This is your question. What's the next movie? I think it uh, brings us a much deeper understanding by the combination of the theory and the observation, a much deeper understanding of how warped space-time behaves when it is extremely warped. I don't think it's going to bring us any closer to being able to do time travel. I wish it would, but that's a, a different direction, and LIGO is uh, heading, LIGO's direction is really understanding the wild dynamics of highly warped space-time. When we look back on the era of the Renaissance and we ask ourselves what did uh, the humans of that era give to us that's important to us today, I think we would all agree it's great art, great architecture, great music. Similarly, in a few hundred years, when our descendants look back on this era and they ask themselves, what are the great things that came to us culturally from this era, I believe they will be an understanding of the fun fundamental laws that control the universe and an understanding of what those laws do in the universe, an exploration of the universe. LIGO is a big part of that.